The core of the sun is composed of highly pressurized gases. What effects do these gases have on the surface of the sun and subsequently on the Earth? A rather ordinary star, our sun is not too young or old, too hot or cold to sustain life here on Earth. And it's close, relatively, just 150 million kilometers away. That's close enough. At this safe distance, the sun gently warms our planet. Closer, and this fireball of hot gas would torch the Earth and everything living on it. The sun has no solid surface, but its extensive atmosphere makes it look smooth. Telescopes help see the truth. The sun boils with activity. Film sensitive to ultraviolet light records plumes of gas erupting from the surface. What we can't see is the sun's core, a highly pressurized mass of gas more than 800,000 kilometers from the surface. Pressure fuels the fusion that burns the gas and makes the sun an extraordinary nuclear reactor. Hydrogen atoms collide with such force they fuse and make helium. Energy moves from here towards the surface as radiation. To learn more about the sun, astronomers sent a robot probe called Ulysses on a multi-year mission. Its study of the solar south pole measured what astronomers could not, magnetic force lines in constant motion. As the force lines move through the sun, they resist the motions of the bubbling hot gas and create cooler spots on the surface. Called sunspots, these areas look black by comparison, but would glow as bright as stars if you could remove them from the surrounding cauldron of heat. Magnetism may also be responsible for the most dramatic of the sun's activities, solar flares. Flares blast from the surface of the sun with the force of millions of hydrogen bombs. Energized particles are flung out on solar wind. When the particles reach Earth, our atmosphere deflects most of them. A few attach themselves to magnetic lines at the north and south poles and strike molecules of air. The air glows with fantastic light called auroras. Borealis in the north, Australis in the south. Daylight, auroras, even moonlight are all produced by the sun. Okay guys, today we're going to talk about the sun and uh, just to clear that up really quick, when that video was talking about things like the, the sun is a ball of fire, um, it's kind of a poetic way to talk about the sun and astronomers will talk about the sun as burning as well, but it, keep in mind it's not a chemical reaction at all. There's not any actual burning going on in the sun. It's not actually on fire. Um, it's all nuclear. Um, uh, not that doesn't make it any cooler, it makes it hotter, but it is, it's not a chemical reaction like fire would be. So let's dive in today and talk a little bit about the sun. Uh, when you think of the sun, uh, most of us don't realize that there's many more structures on the sun than just a perfectly round orb up there in the sky. Um, depending on what light you look at uh, coming from the sun, you see some vastly different things. So just to reiterate this again really quick, uh, don't don't ever stare or look at the sun, right? It's a very, very bad thing for your eyes, especially if you were to do it through, say, some binoculars or a telescope. Um, it's not a, uh, you know, you get a second try sort of thing. It would literally burn your eyeball, um, and then you would be blind. So uh, don't look at the sun. It's not good for your eyes at all. 
but we do use different instruments to view the light from the sun in different wavelengths. We can look at the sun uh, through visible light. We can look at it through infrared, radio, ultraviolet, x-ray, and we see some very different things when we do that. Uh, each, parts of the, each of these parts of the spectrum show us, in, in some respects, different layers of the sun. So we can see deeper into it, we can see further out from the surface, uh, depending on what we, what we look at. Now all these pictures here are actually uh, taken the same day. Uh, so you can see up there at the top, in the, under the visible light, those black spots there are sunspots. And you can see the same spots if you look, uh, there's a section of them there as well, uh, in the infrared, the radio, the ultraviolet, and the x-ray, and they look quite different, don't they? So these parts of the spectrum, they can really tell us some different things, right? Now, just to talk about the electromagnetic spectrum here a little bit, uh, light is, is a spectrum. So there's many different frequencies, many different wavelengths. Um, on the shorter end of the spectrum, we have things like gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet light. Um, you're pretty well familiar with the fact that those are all very bad for you. Uh, we have visible light there. Uh, and that's, of course, what we use to see with our eyes. And then continuing down the longer part of the wavelength, uh, we have infrared, microwaves, and radio waves, which we all use as well. Um, but uh, we arrange this spectrum based on the wavelengths that we're talking about. Here's a quick little picture. Uh, looking at the visible light makes up a very, very small part. This is not to scale. Very small part of the actual spectrum of light. Uh, moving up uh, to shorter wavelengths, you can see that the w distance between peak to peak gets less and less um, as we go up this thing. We go ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma ray. Going the other direction from visible, uh, you notice you come off of, uh, you end up into the infrared, uh, the microwaves, and then we have TV and radio waves. They're very, very long. Um, some of them on the order much longer than even buildings and things like that. They're huge. Uh, the visible light spectrum I just noticed here is actually upside down. That's interesting. They put red at the top and blue at the bottom. It ought to be the other way around uh, if it's going to correspond with the wavelengths that they've drawn there. <laughs> That's an interesting little typo. So, uh, the nature of light. Light is a very strange thing, and humans have spent long, long periods of time, and we're still trying to understand really what light is. Uh, but one thing that we do know is that it's unlike anything else that we've had experience with. Light has two basic properties. You can, see, you can view light as either a wave or as a particle. Now those two things are, are very strangely different. Um, in everyday life, those would be mutually exclusive. Uh, something could be a wave, like a wave in the water, or something could be a particle, like a baseball that you throw. Right? Those are two very different things. They're not the same thing, but in terms of light, they really are. Light is a wave. We can measure properties like its wavelength, the difference from uh, crest to crest. Right? Uh, we can measure um, its intensity. We can measure lots of things that are very much wave properties. But it can also be viewed as a photon. A photon is just a packet of light energy, so it's like a ball of light energy. And those have very specific amounts as well. They have a very specific energy amount. They're not a wave in any way at all. So light has two properties, and it's both at the same time, which is very weird to us in our everyday life because nothing else is like that. Um, but we can make those two measurements. We won't go too much more into that. We'll end up in the, some serious quantum weirdness here. So uh, spectroscopy is just the study of the nature of light. Okay, It's the study of the wave nature of light. And uh, we can split light out into what's called a spectrum. So we can pass light through a prism or a diffraction grating, and it will spread out into a spectrum. Uh, the word spectrum is kind of interesting. It actually comes from the word specter, which basically means, uh, I guess in Latin maybe, means like ghost or invisible. Um, it's like this sort of like a spooky sort of thing, I guess. Uh, but the spectrum is all the wavelengths of light. So in terms of the rainbow uh, or visible light, that's Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Um, the continuous spectrum is just a perfect, continuous, uninterrupted band of all those colors 
including up through radio and gamma and everything else, right, if the object is emitting those. Now, those are emitted by uh, things that get hot. So if you heat up your stove, uh, if you have an old wire coil stove, as it heats up, it will emit a continuous spectrum. So you won't see every color. You'll see the most, uh, the strongest color that its most maximum emission is at. So it might be red, or um, when it's not real hot, it's it's black, right? Okay. Let's talk about a couple of different types of spectra. So we have the continuous spectra, which you would see as the rainbow. We also have something called an absorption and an emission spectrum, and they're a bit different. I've got a picture here at the end that will show you the difference a little bit better, but an absorption spectrum is just the continuous spectrum uh, that's produced when, when the white light, like all the colors, pass through a cool gas under low pressure. So what happens is the gas absorbs specific selected wavelengths of light and the spectrum looks like it has dark lines in it. Okay, so let's picture if you're looking at a star which is emitting the complete spectrum, okay, a continuous spectrum, but there happens to be a big cloud of gas in the way. That gas is going to absorb certain wavelengths coming from the sun and it's going to like re reflect them back off. It's going to re-emit them, scatter them in different directions which aren't going to be in your line of sight. So you'll have missing, missing sections of the spectrum. So it looks like it's got these dark lines in it. That's an absorption spectrum. An emission spectrum is kind of like the same thing, but uh, it's the opposite of it. So instead of seeing a continuous spectrum, all the colors with some dark lines in it, now you don't see the continuous spectrum, but where those dark lines were, you have bright lines. So this is akin to if there was a cloud of gas and dust in front of a star and you weren't looking through the gas at the star but were off at an angle and just looking through the gas into space, uh, what you would get is everything that the gas was absorbing and re-emitting in your direction. So you get these bright spots where, where those particular elements happen to be that are in the gas. Let's take a look at a picture. It'll make a little bit more sense. Uh, we've got the incandescent solid up there, otherwise known as a black body. Uh, that gives us our continuous spectrum. So we've got all the colors of the rainbow. We're passing it through a, a um, prism there. If you've got some gas in front of the star and you're looking through the gas, you're going to see all the colors except the ones the gas is absorbing. Okay, so that's an absorption spectrum. Uh, if you're looking at the gas but you can't see the star behind it, in other words, the star is off to the side somewhere, you're going to see just the element emissions from the gas itself. So you're going to see what's called an emission spectrum. And they, they look quite different, but they can tell us very similar things. right? So the reason we astronomers care about this stuff is because the lines that are in the spectrum actually correspond to what elements exist in the star or the gas or whatever we're looking at. So we can look way out into space and we can tell you precisely there is hydrogen, helium, lithium, uh, carbon, iron, whatever there happens to be in a star or a gas, we know exactly what it is uh, because of this. It's like a fingerprint for the elements. All right, let's talk the Doppler effect. The Doppler effect is something that you probably have some experience with um, but may not realize it. So what this is is an apparent change in the frequency of a wave that's caused by the motion of the source to you, the observer. So let's talk about this in terms of sound waves first. I know you've had an experience where a car has driven past you very fast while you're standing beside the on the side of the road, right? As it's approaching, it kind of has a very high pitch sound, and as it goes by, there's this boom, and it goes to a lower pitch sound. It's most pronounced if there happens to be a siren, like if it's an ambulance or a fire truck or something that's going by, you can really notice the difference in sound as it passes by you. So what's going on there is that the sound waves are either getting compressed or getting stretched. The wavelengths are changing because the thing that's making the sound is moving towards you or away from you. Um, now, in terms of light, light is a very different thing than sound. Like the two are similar in the fact that they're, they're both waves they can both be perceived as waves, but 
uh, when we perceive the difference in wavelength of sounds, we hear pitch. We hear pitch changes. Uh, we hear highs and lows. When you perceive the difference in, in uh, wavelength in light, you don't hear anything, right? But what you see is something very different. When the light shortens its wavelengths, you see a bluer light. When the light lengthens its wavelengths, you see a redder light. So when it, a star or a galaxy, we'll move this forward here, is moving towards you, like the ambulance in this picture, the wavelengths of light, or in the, this case sound, that it's emitting, they shorten, they compress. The, the speed of light doesn't actually change, but the wavelengths actually shorten. And in terms of the ambulance, you hear a higher pitch sound. But in terms of light, you see a bluer light. If the light source is moving away from you, like a galaxy is moving away, we actually see a redder or longer wavelength light coming from it. In terms of the ambulance, you would hear a lower pitch sound. Uh, this is really important because of the fact that it allows us to determine not just relatively, but precisely how fast something's moving um, either towards us or away from us. And that's a huge deal when we want to understand how the universe is expanding and what's actually happening to it. You guys hear those birds there? <laughs> so uh, let's talk telescopes here for a little bit. There's a couple of different types of telescopes. Uh, the first one, the oldest one, is called a refracting telescope, and it uses lenses. I'm sure you've probably heard of this. Uh, this is also how binoculars work. They collect light uh, in, in the, in, with a lens, a big objective lens, that uh, then focuses that light uh, at a specific po point called the focus that if you put your eye there, you get a very clear, crisp picture um, of what's going on. Okay, So these are some of the oldest types of telescopes. Uh, they're some of the first types that were built. Uh, we still use them. They look a lot like this. So you've got the objective lens, the light comes into it like a big bucket, and then it focuses it, and we have our eyepiece. Usually we have a secondary lens there uh, that helps us further focus that, and uh, we get an image of what we're looking at. Let's move on here to the, oh, sorry, a refracting telescope. One of the big problems with these, one of the diff difficulties, is something called chromatic aberration. Uh, and this is where the, the lens, usually the outside edges of the lens, uh, will tend to like not quite focus the light correctly. So you get some kind of fuzzy uh, colored sort of properties around the edges of your image, uh, which, is, which is a big problem with refracting telescopes. It's also difficult to make them very large because those big lenses are really heavy, and if you make a really big one, it starts to deform just under the weight of gravity, um, just under its own weight. So uh, th there's problems with refra refractors, but most, uh, most telescopes, uh, early telescopes, were all refractors. Then comes the reflecting telescope. Huge progress was made in this. These telescopes have a gigantic concave mirror uh, they can be made really, really huge. They can collect tremendous amounts of light. And then that mirror focuses the, the image um, for us. There are lenses in this as well. Um, but it's a, it's a huge advantage just because you can make them really, really big. Um, you, don't have to, you don't have to pass the light through this big piece of glass that gives you all the chromatic aberration that the other telescopes do. So you get better, better quality from your image. Here's a picture of one of the most famous ones, uh, the Keck telescope. And you can see there in the middle, it's a little bit blurry, you can see that big, huge, shiny thing back there on the, on the bottom of it. That's the, that's the mirror, and it's actually reflecting that light back up there towards a the little thing up top that uh, is going to then focus it. Here's another picture of how that looks there. There's a couple of different types of these, depending on where they put the eyepiece. Uh, and where we're looking, but uh, you can see that all of them are reflecting the light um, and then pushing it back out someplace, okay? So uh, all telescopes uh, are, are important and they work in a certain way. Uh, they've got three basic properties that help us see things better. They're light gathering power, they're resolving power, and they're magnifying power. All those things are important in terms of what kind of an image we'll get. Now, a different type of telescope I want to talk about is called a radio telescope. And radio telescopes 
are interesting. First of all, they're humongous, and we can create arrays. So you don't just need one telescope. You can put 30, 40, 50, 100 of them uh, and space them out and then combine all the images that they get together to get one bigger, better picture. Now remember, wait, radio wavelengths are much longer. They're, they're really, really long. So in order to collect a long wavelength, you need a really big telescope. You need a big bucket to catch it. So that's why radio telescopes are spaced out and you have lots and lots of them, not just a single solitary one. Um, I mean, you can, we, we do have those, but they've got to be huge, like mountaintop huge, uh, like Arecibo. Uh, but I don't know if we'll talk about that today. So anyway, let's take a look at some of these radio telescopes. Here's a picture of this. I think this is the very large array out in uh, New Mexico. And uh, they're, they're humongous. They put them on train tracks and wheel them around like train cars uh, to, to uh, organize where they're at across the desert. And then they can move them and focus them. And then the image is all put into a computer and it puts it all together from all those individual telescopes. And, and there can be a lot of them. I think that that array has like something like 28 or almost 30 telescopes in it. Uh, we've even done things where we've combined them from around the world with different arrays. So it's pretty cool stuff. Um, telescope, radio telescopes are unique in another way because radio waves are able to pass through our atmosphere pretty much unhindered. So uh, we can collect information uh, from Earth's surface a lot better than we can even with visible light. It, it moves right through our atmosphere a lot better. So uh, we don't need to put a telescope in space. So a lot of the problems with um, using an optical telescope is that the atmosphere creates this thing called seeing where it, it the movement of our own air in our atmosphere kind of refracts and reflects the light and it makes it blurry it, it's it's not a real good thing so we've started putting telescopes in space because of that but radio telescopes we won't have to do that with because uh, the radio waves don't get bent when they come through our atmosphere uh, it's also the reason we use radio waves to communicate Okay, let's talk space telescopes. I mentioned these already. Uh, the most famous space telescope of all time, the Hubble Space Telescope, has been up there since April of 1990. It's taken some of the most beautiful views of our entire cosmos. It's, it's given us so much information and so much knowledge about space. Uh, it's sad that we've not managed to put a new one up there since 1990, uh, but this thing has received multiple upgrades like new mirrors, uh, there have been spacewalks to fix it, uh, and it just keeps right on trucking along. They don't make them like they used to, right? Here's a picture of the Hubble, uh, of course named after Sir Edwin Hubble, the guy who discovered that the cosmos itself was expanding. Um, super famous guy. It looks like a big tin can in space, doesn't it? That thing on the end of it is the cover for the, the um, opening there. But it's in orbit around our planet. Um, it's not big like the space station, uh, I don't think you can see it zooming by, um, but it's up there. Now, we do have plans. We have had plans to launch an upgraded version of this for a long time, for decades now. And the thing just keeps getting pushed back and back and back. And it's known as the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, everybody, every astronomer is super excited for this thing to be put in orbit because it's going to be even better than Hubble. And Hubble was amazing. So. We're, we're all very anxious for the James Webb to be put up. Its launch date just keeps getting pushed back with problem after problem and funding issues. Um, right now, the launch date is set at 2021. We'll see if that actually happens <laughs> because we've been waiting for decades now at this point. So um, we've got some other stuff up there as well. There's, there's quite a few uh, telescopes in space. Some of them are observing the sun, like the Chandra X-ray Observatory. Um, some of them are, are observing uh, other parts of the cosmos, but we have a number of telescopes in space, um, and they give us some amazing images. Here's a, here's a picture of the Milky Way galaxy itself. So you are in the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, this is our hometown. Those uh, black spots are gas and dust in our galaxy. Okay, we'll talk the structure of the sun here real quick, and then we'll try to wrap things up. <clears throat> So remember, the sun is made of gas. There's no real boundaries between any of its layers. 
uh, but yet we can divide it up into parts as to sort of what's going on inside the layers. Uh, think about that for a second. It's, it's totally, it's a ball of gas. So if you weren't to just burn alive, you could fly a plane through it, right? It's just a big ball of gas, but it's super hot. Let's start from the surface here. Uh, the part of the sun that we might consider the surface for most of us is the photosphere. It's the part that we see. So uh, if we take a picture of the sun using visible light, what we see is called the photosphere. So think photo, photograph. Uh, that's the part that's visible. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's very, very hot. It's not, this region of the sun is not very thick. Um, it's got this sort of grainy texture of these small, bright and darkish uh, regions that we call granules because it's convecting. So it's like boiling. It's boiling gas. Um, but uh, we, we, can, we can look at this part of the sun to figure out what elements are in our sun. Okay. Here's a photo of the structure of the sun, and we'll go over these parts in each individually. But the, the, um, the photosphere is that uh, it's not the outermost layer, but it's the layer that we would see if we were to look at the sun. Uh, then we also have underneath the photosphere a very convective zone where there's some serious motion of gases going on. The radiative zone where radiation is just passing through, but it's not convecting as much. Uh, and then down there deep in the core. And there's a picture of some granulation there, some sunspots. We'll talk about those here in a second. Oop, there we go. Uh, first, the chromosphere. The chromosphere is the very first layer of the atmosphere that's found directly above the photosphere. So going up from the photosphere, the visible part of the sun, we hit what's called the chromosphere. Uh, it's, it's pretty thin. Uh, it's, it's very hot. And it's, it's only a few thousand kilometers thick. Uh, its top has numerous what we call spicules in it. Second. So those spicules are just these really uh, kind of uh, jutting out little narrow jets of material. So here's a picture of the chromosphere. And you can see uh, that look at the outside surface there. Uh, you can see those kind of jets of gas coming off the sun. Okay, the corona. So uh, the corona is the outer weak layer of the solar atmosphere. Uh, its temperature exceeds a million Kelvin. It is crazy hot. The uh, solar wind is coming off from through the corona. It's a stream of protons, electrons ejected at very high speed um, from the corona. So think if this is some very, very hot gas here. Um, so uh, if you are currently thinking that word sounds familiar, well, its root word is also in the coronavirus, right? So uh, corona, basically, uh, we're talking about the sun here. Uh, this is the outer, like, bright, bright, bright part of the sun. You can't actually see it with your eyes. So this is a, a, a tricky thing because when the sun gets eclipsed, uh, a lot of people will sometimes stare up at the sun because it's shocking because all of a sudden the sun went away and it's dark. Uh, but uh, the corona is not eclipsed. It extends far out from the surface of the sun that we can see with our eyes. It's not emitting visible light and it's very damaging to your eyes. So that's why people say uh, don't stare at the sun during an eclipse. And of course, don't ever stare at the sun. But if you're staring at the sun during an eclipse, you don't know that it's hurting your eyes because it's not bright but it's emitting a lot of radiation that are, that's actually destroying your eyes. So once again, never good to stare at the sun, even when it's dark because of an eclipse. Okay, sunspots. So on our sun's surface, on the photosphere, we can see these black spots and they can, be, they can be quite large, uh, like many times the size of our earth uh, to like down to about the size of our earth. So uh, they look dark even though they are crazy hot. They only look dark because they're cooler than the surrounding uh, surface of the sun, which is so much, much hotter. So that's why they look dark to us. If we were to remove the sun itself uh, and just had this, just the sunspot, it would be as bright as the sun. Um, it's, just, it's just that it's cooler than the actual surface. Some other features of our sun, we have things called prominences. Prominences are these kind of huge cloud-like structures uh, of chromospheric gases. 
Uh, they're, they're ionized, they're trapped by the magnetic fields, and so they kind of almost like mimic the field line of the sun, and they stretch out and kind of loop back sometimes. Here's a picture of a prominence. A picture is better than me trying to explain it. See that big thing shooting off the top part of the sun there and wrapping back around? So that's part of one of the magnetic lines of the sun, and the gases, since they're charged, are flowing over that line. We also have solar flares, which you probably have heard of. Uh, these can last about an hour, um, and they're just a sudden brightening of a certain region of, of the sun, usually above a sunspot. So these things have to do with magnetism on the sun as well. Now these solar flares, when they're ejected, um, they release a lot of energy. And a lot of it is in the form of ultraviolet radio and x-ray radiation. Now when, the, when that radiation hits our earth, um, if there's enough of it, it can actually disrupt our power grid. It can really screw some stuff up. Um, it can overload the power grid. It can knock out power on our planet. Um, it can mess up our, our, um, our communications with our satellites. Um, and it's uh, very bad uh, for astronauts. We don't want one of these things going off and having somebody being in space on a spacewalk and then the radiation hitting them while they're in space and not protected by the spaceship. So we, we do monitor these. There's a whole solar um, weather observatory at NASA, and all they do is monitor where these things are happening and which direction they're shooting off. Um, now, some other interesting things happen. When these solar flares hit our, our Earth, uh, we're protected because we have a magnetic field, and the charged particles hit the magnetic field, and then they get funneled around to the north and south poles because that's where our field lines curve back into the planet. Now, as those, some of those charged particles make their way in, they'll hit gases in our upper atmosphere and uh, create this tremendous display of colors, kind of like the lights um, in your room, maybe, if you, if you have fluorescent lights. They excite the gas atoms, and then they give off light. And it's reds and greens and yellows. It's just absolutely beautiful. These are called the aurora. There's two. There's the Aurora Borealis, which is above the North Pole, and then there's the Aurora Australa Borealis, which is the South Pole. Now, last thing I want to talk about here with the sun is what I mentioned at the beginning of this. The sun is not on fire. The sun is undergoing nuclear fusion. So that's different than fission. Fusion is the putting together of atomic nuclei by the collisions of of, of these nuclei under tremendous temperatures and pressures, we basically take in the sun, we take hydrogen, which is number one on the periodic table, collide it together with more hydrogens, and end up creating helium. Okay, As a star ages, that helium can convert into other things. And during the process, a tremendous amount of energy is released um, because some of that matter that's being uh, collided together during the fusion is actually converted into pure energy according to Einstein's equals mc squared. Um, but that's a story for another day. Right now, our sun has been doing this for about 4.5, 4.6 billion years. It will be able to keep on doing this for about another 5 billion years. So right now our sun is it's pretty much middle age. Um, what does that mean for us here on Earth? That means that, yeah, in, in 5 billion years, there's no chance anybody can live on our planet because the sun's going to be out of fuel. Um, however, much, much sooner than that, probably within the next billion years, which is a long time, uh, our sun is going to, uh, start to start to heat up. It's going to start to swell some. And uh, conditions, maybe within the next billion years, might not be that suitable for life on our planet. It certainly be very different. Um, but if humans hope to, dis to survive beyond the next few billion years, we really do have to figure out how to take to the stars. We have to become a truly an interstellar species. Um, whether that'll happen or not, I don't know, but a billion years is a long, long time, right? So we've got some time to figure it out. Uh, nuclear fusion looks a lot like this. You've got some hydrogen nuclei colliding. Those are the protons deep, in, deep inside uh, the, the nucleus of the atom. And when those things collide, we can end up creating helium. So there's a helium-4 created there out of uh, a couple of hydrogens. You actually multiple collision events. It's pretty complicated. Uh, this is called the proton-proton chain. But 
take it basically in the end you, you put together a couple of hydrogens and you basically end up with a helium. Okay, there you have it. Uh, you guys have a good day.